All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm excited to welcome all of you again here for our uh, fourth Technoglass lecture in our fall series. Again, I want to thank Technoglass, our generous sponsor, in making these talks possible. Uh, these talks are critical to the culture of our students, faculty, and profession to hear outside voices from across regions, cultures, and practices. As a brief note, our series is titled The Health, Safety, Welfare of Architecture. What does this mean? For those of you that this is your fourth lecture, maybe you know, for those of you that this is your first, it means the profession defines the duty of architect in terms of health, safety, and welfare. The demands on contemporary architectural practice are stretching these responsibilities to include critical challenges such as social inequity, environmental stewardship, and climate change impacts. The 2023-2024 Technoglass series features practices that have meaningfully impacted the built environment by energizing disciplinary dedications with persistent innovation and imagination. They work through the pragmatic demands of health, safety, and welfare and reach with an expanded material, formal capacity beyond traditional boundaries to tackle the big challenges we face today. Again, I wanna thank Dean Ridal for making this uh, possible um, along with Technoglass. Tonight, I am incredibly honored to be able to introduce Kevin Daly, principal and founder of Kevin Daly Architects. Over his 30 year career, Kevin has defined a design process that upholds the practical magic of architecture, an alchemical conjunction of craft, materials, and form. Bolstered by an abundant research, he has demonstrated the benefits of advanced unconventional building technology in works that are consistently recognized in publications and awards and range from public schools and custom residences to university buildings, workplaces, and affordable housing. For all of these reasons, he is the perfect thought leader to be here with us th this evening. Daly has established a critical practice that is nationally recognized and simultaneously engages the profession as well as the local community. Through his teaching experience, he fosters a next generation of architects across the country. Not only is Kevin a thoughtful architect and a dedicated teacher, but he is also a generous colleague. I'm humbled to have crossed paths with him and each encounter I have with Kevin is more thoughtful than the last. He is always willing to give time and energy to students or creative work to advance the profession. Tonight, Kevin will present his lecture, Neither Inside Nor Out. The lecture engages the series pro proposition that the demands of contemporary practice have outpaced the traditional responsibilities of the discipline through a series of case studies of recent work of KDA. Thank you for your attendance and please help me welcome Kevin. Thank you so much um, for the introduction. Let me see if I can shut down Teams because I hear it beeping in the background. Um, and uh, really thoughtful uh, introduction. Uh, I'm really appreciative of the, of the opportunity to visit Miami. Um, as Shauna mentioned, we've been working for about 30 years. Um, we really started at a moment where, you know, we considered our work, you know, kind of remodeling Los Angeles a block at a time um, and had this sense that, um, you know, we could, you know, we could kind of transform any of the buildings in Los Angeles and, and LA is, is one of these cities that is really extensively and kind of thoughtlessly built. So we, there was this kind of effort to use the existing city fabric as kind of a building material. Um, and I think that's persisted to at least some degree for, you know, in our practice. Um, at this moment, we have, um, we have a small museum in Maine. We have some housing in Arkansas. I just finished a building in Houston. Um, I'm doing my best to kind of get more work in Los Angeles, uh, but uh, you can only do so much. And, and I, but I think it also kind of, for us, challenges this idea of, of practice as a place-based undertaking. 
and to some extent kind of challenges, you know, with our own kind of self, our own identity as a Los Angeles studio. Um, and I think maybe that's resonant with some of the people in the audience who kind of are really identified with South Florida and, and working here and working in the culture and, and the kind of building tradition here. Um, so, and I think kind of in retrospect, maybe there's a logic to this. I think we've always been um, kind of agnostic about stylistic elements um, and uh, that, you know, that characterize very particular practices. Um, we expect our design process to lead us to specific outcomes. You know, what are the circumstances of this project? what are the kind of, what are the implications of that? Let's pick one. And then what are three options that are driven from that? So we have a kind of, you know, a very if then process within our studio. Um, and I think that has also led to kind of a, you know, portfolio work where people say, um, you know, the work kind of shares characteristics, but none of it looks alike. Um, and I don't, I don't really know if that's good or bad, but that's those are the kind of circumstances we're in. Um, I see ourselves as generalists, and I think the kind of disciplinary imperative that Shauna mentioned, um, you know, of this kind of crisis moment in the environment, in in the kind of social equity of, of the constructed environment, um, really emphasizes the role of generalists. Um, and so our work really has, you know, over the last 10 years or so has been in kind of three categories. We do workplace. We've been doing workplace projects, mostly for a giant social media company. Um, we do university and public buildings, and we do affordable housing, and in some cases, student housing as well. Um, I think that that's a, it's a broad range of, of kind of work for a small studio. We had a contractor visit our office once who we showed him around and showed him the shop. And then he wanted to go to the education studio. And, you know, it's basically, everything is all us. Um, so, and I think sort of generally, I think if there's sort of a mission in our office, it's really to find ways of, um, you know, of fostering virtuosity in construction. So in some weird ways, I, I kind of see us as taking a secondary role in finding ways of making builders build the best thing possible. And I think that means in a lot of cases, really adopting kind of convention, and especially local convention, and really working with that and looking for ways of intervening in construction convention. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so, uh, let's see, I need to start these things. Um, we, there we go. I think these, um, videos would be a little bit bumpy. Um, so kind of wanted to look back at a couple of the earliest projects we did, uh, a couple houses. Um, and and I think, you know, in particular, you know, coming for a lecture like this gives, gives me a chance to, you know, kind of look a little bit more closely at the kind of prompt behind this, you know, that the demands of contemporary practice have outpaced the traditional responsibilities of the discipline. And and I think anyone in practice now feels like there's kind of a performance expectation that is exceeding, you know, what's possible to actually accomplish at, at a disciplinary level. Um, and I think that it's a little bit of a chance to reconsider how we explain our work to ourselves and others. Um, I think we all have to acknowledge that the environmental impact of building, constructing and operating buildings is, is just overwhelming. Um, that the urgency in building equitably in our society is just leaves us at this kind of critical moment kind of within the discipline. And uh, so these two buildings, we'll take a little closer look at these. Um, I think what these do is um, find ways of 
you know, what we've always considered one of the kind of primary undertakings we should be engaging, which is kind of, you know, allowing the building to spill past the site, you know, allowing it to spill past the sort of edge of, you know, the boundary of, of, the, of the building itself and treat that boundary as something that is potentially inhabitable. And that, that kind of boundary condition is something that both influences how the building operates and also influences the site. So a couple of these things, um, uh, you know, are, are kind of, you know, early studies that, that we undertook as, you know, as, as early residential projects. Um, let me just keep going here. So the first one, this little house in Valley Center, um, I think you can see the, you know, the agricultural land division, and this is um, the kind of, um, it's where the civil engineering grid breaks down and the kind of, you know, agricultural natural grid picks up again. Um, it's also a place where the kind of urban and wild lands interface has made it so that you know, increasing amounts of not just California and not just Southern California, but, you know, there are wildfires now in Louisiana, in Northern Canada. And I think this kind of urban wildlands interface is now something that we need to start engaging, not just at the level of buildings, but the level of site planning and, and site considerations. Um, so this house replaced one that, that uh, was, kind of evaporated in a wildfire. This was probably 15 years ago. Um, you know, as we worked on the project, we recognized that the building would have to, you know, manage the usual kind of thermal and, and kind of environmental tasks, but also kind of take on this broader issue of, of being kind of refractory towards the, the fire and the heat that was associated with that. And what we tried to do is find ways of engaging sort of a building system that that expanded beyond just the envelope. It wasn't really just about protecting it. It was really about kind of creating this um, kind of inhabitable envelope that was around the building and the elements that could then protect the building also could be elements that that kind of really improve the quality of life. So you can see there's two kinds of operable panels here, one big set of garage doors that are horizontal there, and, and another set of, um, of big giant bifold doors. <clears throat> the bifolds were light enough for a little kid to push around and, and sturdy enough to stay in place in high winds. But this is a, this is a location that's in a high desert. And, um, and really what we tried to do was find ways of both protecting the house and then also kind of changing the sort of thermal environment and the sort of, um, you know, sort of perceptual environment that, that was around it. Um, so you can see kind of basic kind of construction details. These were all built kind of with, I don't know, like a carpenter who could work with aluminum. Um, so, we were just having a conversation before the lecture about the kind of cost of construction. And I look back on these and see a, a degree to which we could be involved in the production of things that I think has, has become prohibitive and become really complicated now. Um, but you can see in this image here, the kind of substantial amount of shade that's created by the kind of, by the way these things are deployed and how the sort of experience within the house is totally different by having a shaded space immediately outside and that these things could all then fold back up and keep the building cool when it was un uninhabited and protected when there was a fire. Um, and then further, we kind of use the kind of building planning was to move the habitable spaces even further away from the glass line. So it was kind of this effort to kind of create this kind of real hierarchy of, of spaces around it. One big single seismic element that holds up, hold up this uh, this part of the building, um, but you know the building was really about. You know, we also there were other kind of things that were buried in this. The roof could be the gutters could be blocked and then flooded if there was an imminent fire. 
So all these kind of plan B strategies that were built into it, that were built into the kind of shape and geometry and the kind of, you know, the nature of the way the project was built. Um, this house um, has been kind of a workshop of sorts for us. Uh, it's, in an, it's an urban site in Venice, California. Um, when our clients bought this, we were, they, they kind of put forward this, you know, slightly um, paradoxical challenge of kind of adding density and privacy at the same time. Um, so what we did was fabricate a series of these screens and panels and find ways of making sure that those could be integrated into the landscape. So I think for us, this idea of this envelope that is no longer just a single kind of you know, array of building elements was was really kind of a strategy for um, for also integrating the building into the landscape. So there's Venice, California, if any of you have visited out there. Studies for how these pieces could kind of fold and kind of mesh together towards the center of the site. And then these start to show, I think, this kind of, you know, intermediate space that is outside the building, but still kind of fully occupiable. Um, the screen elements really are intended to be inhabitable spaces. And then the idea was that as these kind of screens were, were you know, built onto the project and, and kind of built in and around the existing landscape, there was this kind of measure of privacy that um, was a consequence of the, the kind of reflecting quality of glass, the screening quality of the metal, the kind of diffuse quality of light coming through trees, and then another set of metal and glass, and really kind of building that kind of level of privacy through these kind of repetitive and alternating layers. Um, and then about 10 years after that, they bought the parcel next door and their family had grown a little bit and the guy's parents had gotten older. They wanted to move to California. So it was kind of a, a you know, monopoly property shuffle. Um, and we built another house for them next door and put a pool on the property line between the two. And didn't really want to replicate that same perforated metal you know, vocabulary, wanted to kind of turn this into kind of a wooden screen project that still you could kind of see right through and see the gardens on the other side of the house. But you can see the two pieces kind of living together. Oops, sorry about that. Um, and really just kind of the same set of openness and kind of borrowing the same set of ideas about connecting to the landscape to kind of create these kind of distances and boundaries between the between the houses. Um, this one probably had, you know, like a higher level of finish than the first one. It was the first one was kind of like put together with, you know, like I said, carpenters who knew how to work with aluminum. Um, so this idea that housing could be, we could extend this set of ideas from a single house to the way we build housing we really started to employ in this project, this is a, a little housing project for uh, young people who have come out of foster care, what they kind of euphemistically call transitional age youth. Um, and, uh, you know, I think as far as we were concerned, you know, and I think this kind of points to the sort of disciplinary limitations of practice at this moment, we really didn't have good examples for, you know, for exactly what that kind of housing should be. And we also didn't really have the kind of direct experience of, you know, of, you know, everyone's lived in an apartment, but, but who's moved into, you know, a little housing unit when you've never had anything of your own, not a piece of furniture, not anything. Um, so we kind of struggled a little bit for fig to figure out exactly what that should be. What we decided to do is we just shouldn't waste an inch of the site and everything we built had to you know, we had to cover every legal kind of every bit of allowable lot coverage and then replace anything that we could with rooftop gardens, second story gardens. Um, and then in between these little blocks of buildings, you know, basically each person got a little building, uh, a small public space, a stair up to a sleeping loft, and then a garden immediately outside of it. And you can see the gardens 
are all fully separated from each other. So everyone had privacy and security. And then between these things, we just covered everything we could with, uh, with trellises that became the public spaces of the building, shared workspaces and counseling center and kitchen and things like that. So that ended up being the kind of that. End, this is the vocabulary of the building. Let's see. Um, and then, and really just kind of like the capacity for this to kind of pan along and become a little bit of a community of its own. You can see how little space isn't built on and, you know, isn't kind of fully put it to use uh, in the service of the project. The very front turns into this kind of shared kitchen and then we took over the front yard as kind of a outdoor dining space. Um, so here's kind of cross sections. Um, the idea was that each of these, we had this conversation with one of the young people who was a kind of wasn't moving in, but potential kind of within the kind of cohort of people. And he was like, yeah, I mean, I've got, can I bring my bike in? And I'm like, yeah, dude, it's your apartment. You can do whatever you want. He said, no, but I mean, can I bring the bike in? And like, it was clear that like, you know, there, these are people that had have had no agency whatsoever you know, in the, or control over their environment. And so we kind of took that as, as sort of like, you know, what would the interiors be like if, you know, if these were just kind of turned loose and you can kind of see different kinds of finishes and papers and graphics and, and kind of color and things like that, that would really become part of the experience of this. And then the buildings themselves kind of ran right past these trellis pieces, these kind of greenhouses to become uh, the kind of the exterior of the building became the wall. Um, I want to include this project because it was a little prototype we built with UCLA students. Um, we have been working with UCLA City Lab for a long time, kind of uh, in some ways we're the sort of test kitchen for the policy work of UCLA's urban design uh, think tank. And they were they were kind of behind the legislation that became California's ADU law, and so this was this was kind of a study. And because it was an academic project, we kind of instead of just you know there are plenty of things you can open a Dwell magazine and order an ADU. We kind of said, well, all right, environmentally, how far can we push this? You know, what 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 is possible with this, and can we reduce the the environmental impact of a backyard building by an order of magnitude. And really the only way to do that is really reducing the material intensity of the construction. So you can see up there in that corner um, by eliminating, you know, by using helical foundations and eliminating concrete, you can see we were kind of flirting with you know, overall, um, you know, order of magnitude reduction in the, in the kind of material intensity of the project. And that, actually translates to more than order of magnitude of reduction in the kind of greenhouse impact of the project. So really light um, steel building, a uh, steel tube frame building that with a stretched fabric over it, um, you know, operable and, and kind of louvered. And then between these two layers of ETFE, we're imagining varying thicknesses of, of kind of lens-like kind of interstitial space that would block sun at certain times of year and allow sun at others. Um, so you know, pretty ambitious for a student project. Um, had to be built in 10 weeks. Um, and we got the best electrician at UCLA to build, to bend conduit for the structural frame um, and yeah, and got kind of permission to use a courtyard as we just kind of, you know, assembled this thing, wrapped it, made this sort of representation. This is an ETFE, it's a shrink wrap material, um, but started to kind of make this idea that in fact, you know, you could create this kind of boundary that is, is as minimal as possible um, and kind of really take it as, as a buck Buckminster Fuller kind of, you know, almost kind of reducing it to a building system 
um, renderings, and then here's the finished building. Um, I really like the kind of quality of this, the kind of light quality of it, um, and uh, and I think it was it was uh, it was provocative. Uh, somebody said that it was the the building that that everyone needed but no one wanted. It's it's pretty transparent. Um, so kind of returning to this idea of this kind of layering um, within the kind of, of connecting sort of private space to, to landscape, um, we, we started doing affordable housing probably about 15 years ago. Um, this woman who's kind of a housing activist got in touch, said, you know, I saw some of these charter schools you did. Yeah, maybe you should do some housing. And I'm like, uh, you know, I don't, it's, I know that's a specialty. You know, maybe you should call one of the specialists. And she's like, she kind of like, you know, you know, took me to task and said, look, if you're in Los Angeles and you're not doing housing, you're actually not contributing to the kind of the nature of the city because basically the whole place is about housing. And we kind of see it on the glide path. It seems like it's roads and stuff like that. It's actually, it's housing. Um, so, you know, so we started, we started looking a little more closely at kind of housing prototypes at, you know, dingbat apartments that really, you know, are from Southern California to Houston. Um, you know, what is this kind of typology of the kind of courtyard and the, and the two-story typology with parking underneath? And, and whether or not there was a possibility of kind of taking that type, breaking it into more kind of logical pieces, pulling, pushing it around, you giving taking enough kind of scriptural force to push it out to the edge of the site. And then when you do that, you need some kind of piece to kind of connect it all together. And so that's kind of what this project was. Um, it was um, an unair conditioned building. So what we did was look at strategies for reducing heat gain by shaping these kind of window cutouts, window projections. And and we developed a series of typologies for the for those window projections. And then on West, Santa Monica's got a crazy orientation. It's not north, south, east, west, but on western facing and eastern facing sides, we let the vertical pieces get much longer. On southern facing sides, let the horizontal pieces get much longer. It just kind of within this typology allowed this kind of you know, it's, it's primary architectural intervention to kind of grow and morph and, and become the sort of the, the architecture of the building. Then the connecting piece, this kind of Gumby shaped thing that connected it all um, ends up being a much more logical thing. And it kind of took on the role of that perforated metal screen in the Palms house. You know, it made it so people can be in their apartment leave windows and doors open, but you've got a wooden screen and a big set of sycamore trees and another wooden screen. And so there was a sense of privacy, even with really close proximity. And then here are the kind of in indoor implications of it. Um, we had arranged for photographer Ewan Vaughn to come shoot the project and and he 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 just travels all the time and so if you're somewhere in the world if you just stay there he'll 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 show up um but he was supposed to show up in this one particular day but that was also the day that Arizona State University's housing studio visited so like all these photos kind of look like we're about to have like a dance party or something but you know the the kind of screen piece ended up being this kind of alto s thing surprisingly enough that wasn't really our intention and then these sycamore trees are planted right through the parking structure and right into kind of live earth so those now are probably 50 feet tall uh, and then a more recent uh, housing project gramercy housing similar set of ideas um we still make a lot of models in our office um this one uh, the model makers might have gone um maybe under supervised for a while because you can see they 
took photos of the scale figures and then made family photos um, you know, within the units. But really, you know, I think what we have found, and maybe this is in part kind of a the legacy of coming out of Frank Gehry's office of, you know, the kind of tradition of like the model always has to be up to date, whatever you're doing, you, you know, as the model, as the process moves along, the models can get bigger and more detailed, but basically always have to be up to date. We still believe in that, um, you know, in spite of how central the computer is to our work and all that stuff, renderings. I think, you know, I think when it comes right down to looking at things with clients, or people unfamiliar with architecture models are still the kind of lingua franca that that everyone has to be able to de depend on. Um, and and I think you know we've also found that they you know there's there's kind of a level of veracity that's really striking and and really is is kind of you know is not something that can easily be replicated through other means. So this is a senior housing project this was um senior affordable and 50 percent uh former homeless residents um typically in los angeles that's been a really difficult painful painful process in the kind of presentation of projects like this to the public i think the the city and the kind of sensibility now is you know is much more Kind of open-minded towards housing you mm -hmm. know that in fact you know if this housing get built maybe there will be fewer people living in the alley behind their house and i think there is kind of a certain amount of self-interest but also just kind of a rec recognition of a collective necessity for housing to be built um, really focused on outdoor spaces um, this idea that we can build smaller and more effective, you know, more efficient and simple units if we also provide spaces immediately outside. Each person, even on the upper levels, has kind of a little front porch um, with enough room for a couple chairs so that people visiting don't have to be kind of within this tiny little residential area. And then a lot of outdoor space, kind of generally shared outdoor space. It's kind of like the, I don't know, that's the the most economical. I think the outdoor space is really the most economical sort of piece you can add to affordable housing, especially to to transform it without making it, you know, cost a lot more. So, I, about eight years ago, we started doing work for this huge social media company, um, where. You probably don't have accounts there, but your parents do. Um, it, but they it's a it's a big conglomerate now. Um, they always really focused on kind of amenities, especially things like food service, really, really fancy uh, food preparation. Um, what we found is that, you know, with a huge amount of repetition, they put a lot of people in desks. What we were designing in these very large projects, was only about 10% of what, you know, the space they had rented. So it became a much more manageable design exercise. Um, so you can see some of the interior and material qualities kind of using the New York City um, kind of sidewalk food vendor vocabulary of, of press stainless, um, really kind of, you know, this kind of landscape of seating. Um, and then really just kind of pushing back on this idea that, you know, as this company got bigger and bigger, um, what we needed to do was focus more on smaller and smaller groups of people. So really just started pushing this idea that, that the kind of level of furniture, the scale of furniture and the scale of three to five or six people sitting together to work together was really the kind of design focus. You know, that's what we can contribute. The corporate culture, you know, I don't think you know, we weren't really engaged in, but we could sort of make a difference at the level of, of kind of individual people. You can see some of these here, kind of, you know, small gathering spaces, spaces to kind of find a little privacy for yourself. Um, and then they rented some space in like the biggest development in New York. Um, so you can see that kind of spiral building 
uh, that's just being finished now, a Bjarke Ingalls project, the project we were working on um, in a Norman Foster, brand new Norman Foster builder building, and then next to KPFs, uh, 30 Hudson Yards. Um, the project, you know, so this was kind of confounding for us. You know, it's you know, they rented more than a million square feet. Um, and and I, I think as we started looking at it, started realizing that it was actually pretty straightforward, um, you know, that we really need to kind of create the sort of, you know, this threshold that went from the kind of corporate lobby to their lobby and kind of create, you know, refresh that experience really directly. Um, and then there was kind of a big block of workspace. Um, and then what they refer to as amenity floors. And so that's where a lot of the focus was. Um, so here's a model of an kind of entire, this is like 50% of their projects. There's another upper stack above this. But, you know, for brand new building, you know, basically what we had to do was cut some gigantic holes in it um, and, uh, and find ways of people arriving and then moving easily through these kind of lower levels creating this uh, kind of shoots and ladders connection up to the upper levels um, and then up to the very top where, um, you know, it, it kind of turns into the kind of food service spaces and places where people all kind of um, kind of gather at least once or twice a day and, um, and kind of build these stairs that were also kind of seating elements um, that were wide enough so that you could carry two tacos and still text your friends without tripping. Um, and then the very top uh, you can see is is kind of an outdoor terrace. I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, you know, renderings. And so what we ended up doing was building one of the highest kind of outdoor spaces. So here are the kind of model spaces the kind of arrival stairs. Here's the completed project. Really burdened um, and kind of, you know, open and in some ways kind of a counterpoint to the vocabulary of this very strict grid of the building, a uh, very beautifully executed building. Um, and then start building these kind of big sort of shaped pieces that were really recognizable as ways of getting, you know, getting through one level to another um, so it was easy for people to text your friends, where are you sitting, and and kind of connect. But you know, by doing that, um, but these kind of big folded planes of, of kind of wooden seating is these kind of hyper, you know, kind of mashed up programs of of circulation and and not circulating. One of the ways we did that was kind of going back to them and saying, look, you know, how are, you know, everyone doesn't have the same agenda. Some people are going to want to get food. They're going to want to pause for a second and they're going to want to keep moving. So there was this kind of big inventory of the kinds of places where people would hang out because this was their kind of, their kind of primary amenity. See model shots here. Some of these perch tables where you could, you know, be, as sociable or as unsociable as you chose, depending on how you sat there. Um, but this terrace, um, you know, kind of creating this sort of natural environment, 300 feet up in the city, ended up being this huge challenge um, because as it turned out, the terrace was actually just kind of a formal step to meet the zoning requirements within the city and wasn't really configured to be used. Um, and the downdraft off of the upper part of the building was so substantial that it was basically, it wasn't usable for most of the year, maybe on a very still day. And so developing this, uh, this uh, canopy piece ended up being a huge part of how, you know, how this, how the whole terrace became inhabited. So we worked with this landscape firm, Escape, that, you know, did this really fantastic job of kind of bringing planting up to about an eight foot level. And that was in part just kind of a wind mitigation strategy. The canopy had to be 30% open, no matter how you calculate it. And so some of that 
meant that we'd cut these big holes and then push trees through them. Um, the top surface is perforated and the undersurface is perforated. And that 30% was intended to slow the wind enough so that it didn't just bounce and kind of create a problem adjacent to it. But as we started looking at this, it was all these canopy pieces were tested um, in, um, you know, up in Ontario where they test, you know, they do wind testing. And the first one we designed kind of a stretched the width of the of the terrace and it created such a negative pressure on the facade that it was actually, it would have caused the facade panels to fail. So here's drone footage, um, but kind of creating this, you know, this kind of real spare, um, but lush kind of rooftop, uh, I don't know, seascape, um, that you know it ends up being i think the idea for us was that if we could really just take the kind of habitable season of the year and extend it that would be the objective you know this kind of idea that there's a shoulder season that and you can see these things the canopy itself was fat was prefabricated by um uh zaner in kansas city <clears throat> you know barcoded and shipped to the site and so what those guys are doing is there was a design kind of requirement that there was no opening in it bigger than three quarters of an inch because they were afraid birds would nest in it. So so those guys were just kind of with pliers opening this kind of perforated kind of cut out. And each of those went in slightly different directions. And then you can see on the right kind of a giant light scoop to bring light down to the stairs below. <clears throat> um, that's this guy, big light monitor. Um, but the kind of, I mean, so this idea of this kind of the model being to really foretelling, um, you know, the kind of experience of the place. I was really pleased with the way this one, you know, kind of worked in that way. A little bit more than renderings because there's always this kind of temptation to put more trees in with Lumion. So here are construction photos, trippy kind of, you know, space underneath while they're constructing it. You can see the canopy actually has like a slight, you know, a couple of different bulges in it in order to, for it to not just be a mirror, mirror um, direct mirror of what was below it. Totally freezing construction site it is way, way up above the city. So then public buildings, <clears throat> um, uh, this is a project we did at UCLA. It's an addition to the music building. I think a lot of campus work is really about recovering space that had been kind of like, you know, somewhat thoughtlessly kind of utilized at UCLA at one point had you know had kind of a ring road of of service and circulation and as the campus grew that became a really central you know kind of a corridor of the campus so this building i think within our the way we looked at it we're just off of the historic core of the campus and um as we were researching brick installations you know the some of the brickwork on the historic ucla campus is just it's so beautifully done royce hall and the big library powell library and we just decided you know we would never be able to kind of in the con current construction environment never be able to achieve that level of kind of you know of technique and kind of material presence and and kind of tactility um so we started working with uh, a, a terracotta manufacturer and said, well, look, if we pick two of your standard colors, um, what we wanted to do was, was take a standard kind of extrusion and make a slightly different extrusion, one that tilted out, which then they could also install upside down, so it tilted in. Um, we had them leave 10% of the terracotta in the oven a little bit longer than they were supposed to, and that darkened it slightly. And they took 10% of the terracotta and polished it. So by doing that, 
what we tried to do was build the kind of color density and the kind of color range that was characteristic of the of the campus brick palette, um, this kind of famous uh, UCLA brick palette. Um, so that's, you know, that was the kind of research component of it. And you can see these battens between each of those tiles is really about closing off the exposed end of the extruded terracotta. Um, super complicated, technically complicated building, you know, kind of making one of the quietest spaces on campus in one of the noisiest corners of the campus. Um, and so the building kind of floats and has its own, you know, totally isolated foundation system. Um, and then uh, kind of acoustically, we had three acousticians, one really technical one, one kind of like focused on the vibe of, you know, the kind of psychoacoustics. Um, and then one who focused on recording. And we just decided partway through that if, if two of those people agreed, we could, we could proceed because we were never gonna get all three of them to agree on anything. Um, we've done a big, uh, we did a big basketball training facility at UCLA. And this was really just kind of this idea that we should make, you know, we should make a big wooden shed. Um, and John Wooden, you know, the famous basketball coach at UCLA, um, you know, a friend of ours told us that, that we, they thought we were doing the only religious building on campus, you know, super famous presence. And, and so what we started thinking about was that we should, we should turn this into kind of like, like an armature for learning basketball and make it like a piece of equipment. And so, so really what it is, is kind of a light harvesting device. And we wanted the, and you can kind of see this in this photo, the level of daylight in every corner, every square foot of the practice court had to be equal and had to be even. And if it was light outside, it was light inside. So put a lot of effort into kind of creating these big clear stories. You can kind of see kind of counterintuitively spanning the long direction. Um, and, but economically just kind of making using the same truss and flipping it back and forth. And what that did was kind of push the apex of that opening further to the edges of each of those spaces so that we could distribute light to the to the far corners of the building. And then the kind of curve that was developed by doing that also acted as kind of a light reflector. It kind of changed. It was a diffuser that that allowed us to um, to kind of bounce light around in, in the inside of the building. It has a ventilation system that's pulled in from below. So there's no ducts in the building. And as the air is pulled in through that kind of cool earth, we you know, largely have been able to kind of stay outside of the campus um, conditioning system, the campus chilled water system. Um, so let's see, I'll show you one more project. I think um, so. The Houston Endowment um, advertised uh, for you know qualifications. A whole bunch of people uh, sent in, like uh, you know, a hundred, hundred and fifty. You know, teams applied for it. I had been teaching with a friend, Juana X, from Protectura at UCLA, and we'd always been saying, you know, we should definitely find something to work on. So we ended up sending for this one end up winning the competition and then having to find like right at the start of the pandemic a way of working together on it. Um, I mean, it was actually a really, it was a very nice collaboration, but uh, slightly more complicated than we were anticipating when we said, hey, why don't we do this together? Um, you know, the bayou and the kind of landscape, if you've ever been to Houston, is all, maybe in some ways like Miami, this kind of green canopy that really characterizes a lot of the city. We sent this as part of, you know, before we started on the project for us, kind of our qualifications package. The endowment is, you know, funds um, uh, all kinds of public initiatives in the city, um, health, access to, you know, education, access to outdoor space. And, and everyone knew what the endowment was. No one really knew what it looked like, including us and including them. Um, so what we did was go back to them and say, look, really what you need is is kind of a, you know, a front door for people to come to and a back porch for you to sit down and, and look over this park. 
um, and uh, really surprising, you know, looking at this image of this kind of low profile civic presence was kind of, it's kind of what we built. Um, but, you know, kind of fit into this kind of tradition of very spare buildings in Houston. You know, so one of these situations where we're kind of like standing on the shoulders of giants, um, really beautiful building by Thomas Pfeiffer and the piano, obviously. Um, but, you know, when you work on a competition, you don't have any idea what it's gonna cost or what the materials are, you're just trying to get the thing done. Um, and in this particular case, you know, the competition actually became something that we are always trying to achieve. I mean, it was this really kind of strange set of circumstances. Um, so here are some before and afters. I mean, the kind of degree to which we kind of kept returning to the competition documents to kind of inform our own decision making as it was moving forward um, was was a really central thing. Um, and in particular, so we I think we had one meeting before the lockdown, almost all the rest of the design and the early parts of construction, we, you know, we, we had never, we hadn't been to Houston in like two years. Um, so we had this competition, did a little bit of work, they priced it, the 100% SD came in at $45 million, uh, their budget had been 20. I think all the different teams on the, in the competition kind of thought, oh, well, that's just like, they're just like, they're, they're joking about that. They're just trying to keep our fees low. And then started talking into the endowment and they're like, no, it actually is 20. Because especially now with the pandemic, if we take money, you know, if we use money for this building, we're not giving it to these community members. And now there's like this tremendous amount of need. So all through schematic design and all through design development, we just kind of kept chipping away at kind of rationalizing building systems, doing all the stuff that you normally would do. We had this fantastic contractor, which is tireless in pricing things. And <clears throat> we got to the point, you can see in the third column, May of 2020, you know, the cost per square foot had come way down, the square footage had come down, um, and we were flirting with the 20s, but we were never gonna be at 20 million. And we had one meeting, you know, Zoom meeting with them, asking about how they would use these different parts of the project. And we realized they're never gonna use anything on the first floor. And so we just kind of dropped the whole building and um, tried to maintain the sort of visual characteristics that's kind of like relatively tall and kind of skinny and kind of its lightness. Um, but, you know, but, you know, but finally got, and the contractor signed a contract for $21.5 million. Um, it's a net zero building um, for, depending on how you calculate it. Ironically, one of the things that really boosted its efficiency was when they went to a four day work week, because then there was a three day period where they were producing a huge amount of photovoltaic energy and not using any of it. Um, pretty extensive geothermal system. Um, ran into just a lot of resistance at every step, you know, with the kind of some of the trade groups in Houston, you know, the industry that puts in air conditioning is a really robust one. And so, you know, had to kind of continually demonstrate that these other strategies would actually work. Um, and then did started doing that by saying, look, you know, here's a typical office building here's how close we can get to net zero by adding these as kind of a toolkit of strategies and, and a toolkit of, of systems. And each of them does this, you know, very specific set of things. Um, and as we started, oops, as we started, a tiny little one, um, looking at the kind of cladding, I think when we started, they sort of imagined themselves having a terracotta building glazed terracotta building. It became clear that they couldn't afford it. This is just outside of our office. Here comes a palm tree. Um, and we started building, you know, mock-ups of, you know, devices that were kind of scaled, you know, scallops and things like that, that were, you know, the scale we wanted to use. We looked at GFRC and kind of started ruling things out. And I think the thing that was most interesting for us about the process of, of looking at these material possibilities was that 
we came to the realization that um, the the building had to, you know, have this kind of exterior characteristic of it had to it had to shade itself, and that's what caught you know that's what established this big canopy, and the big canopy really is part of the envelope of the building. Um, it also produces energy, but as we started looking at the cladding materials themselves, these are the kind of louvers at the top, some of the sun studies for the amount of light coming through. Um, what we realized was the, the cladding had to be, we had to use the least amount of mass possible because the greater the mass of the exterior, um, the, the more problematic it becomes in very high heat settings because you know, when it's never, when it, when it gets to the point of the year where it's 80, 85 degrees at night also, there's no way to reject heat into the environment. So we started looking, we, the building itself is a steel frame with cross laminated timber framing. Um, we started working with this fabricator down in Monterey, Mexico. So we had all the wood framing coming from Canada coming across the, you know, one transnational effort. These guys were making the canopy and the exterior cladding. They said, you know, I think we can use even less aluminum. And we said, well, we're worried that in the sun, we're gonna start seeing rivets or joint lines, you know, from the stiffening behind these panels. And they they created this, you know, you know huge mock-up of, you know, of the building, put digital thermometers all over it, and really just test it and kind of said, look, we got this up to 145 degrees. You can't see anything. And there's this kind of degree that it was, you know, this very empirical degree that I think is really hard to achieve otherwise, you know, and I think because they were this, you know, that the, they've done some stuff locally, they did the lobby of the Zaha Tower in Miami. Um, they just had this kind of, you know, real roll up your sleeves attitude about solving problems um here you can see it's kind of you know you can see the light we we're trying to make sure that we you know hit primary windows with the canopy you know uh, sun protection so here you can kind of see that these columns you know these super like kind of improbably light columns really become part of the yeah, they are kind of part of the facade. Here's some finished photos. Um, the louvers themselves kind of pull through. These are not actually joists. They're, these are kind of sound control wood baffles. Um, get slightly shifted geometry because we use the geometry of the site to maximize the size of the canopy and then placed a simpler building underneath it. Um, and then, so I think this, you know, the, you know, this was kind of like, a, you know, as a strategy for building and, the, and kind of taking this idea that, that, you know, the, the, you know, resisting this idea that the envelope can be developed as a specialty. And I think that's one of the kind of, I think the, one of the real disciplinary challenges we face now is really pushing back on the kind of specialists and experts that are absolutely essential to the process. Um, so just real quickly, um, what's next? Um, we're just working on this little museum north of Boston um, called the Agunquit Museum of Art. Um, tiny little artist community, artist colony there, kind of mostly landscape, you know, seascape paintings. Um, when we first looked at it, you can see the pink was the original building. The kind of outline next to it was um, kind of a poorly constructed addition in the 1980s. And that what they had planned on doing was, you know, is adding a second story to it. And, you know, we they couldn't have found an architect further from Maine than our office. Maybe if they'd made something in San, San Diego, it applied. Um, and we just kind of thought, well, we don't have anything to lose. We should just tell them that they should do that. And instead, you know, kind of said, look, you know, there are, there are examples. I think if you can make a pocket edition of the Louisiana Museum 
in outside of Copenhagen, that's the direction it should go. It should be something that focused on circulation and really just reorients the entire building back to the back to the ocean. Here's some of the um, kind of famous paintings within their collection. So here's a little here's a little animation. Um, so, and we also kind of said, you've got this great tradition of wood framing here, of kind of timber construction in Maine. This has to be made entirely in the state and, and take advantage of the fact that people can be fabricating during the winter in big factories and then bring pieces completed to the site. It would make it so this seasonal museum wouldn't miss a season. <clears throat> So here's the original building. You kind of look right through. We we propose making a little bit of a courtyard that then could be used for events and weddings and things like that. But the biggest issue was really kind of offsetting these kind of very repetitive, non-identical pieces in a way that also kind of created outdoor kind of sculpture gardens and sculpture galleries. So this is just getting underway now. You can obviously see like the Parish Art Museum and the kind of other precedents that, you know, that we wanted to adopt as kind of these, you know, kind of ocean hunt art experiences. Um, and then kind of complicated phasing and, you know, for budget reasons, they'll build several of these pavilions, move into them and then build the rest, the other three or four later. So you can kind of see how these things kind of open and dead end. Um, and then this idea that in fact, you know, kind of we, we, there would be a way of reinforcing the connection to the ocean, which also kind of connects back to their kind of original, you know, their original collection, um, really opening visibility of the ocean as much as we could. Little site model we brought to our interview. Um, and so this is just after a year, kind of just getting underway. Um, so, you know, I think for us, there's, you know, there is this kind of paradox in practice um, that, you know, that, that we kind of collectively have to resist this kind of, you know, this implicit sort of specialization within, within practice. Um, and, and I think, you know, in terms of sustainability and envelope design and life cycle considerations, I mean, all those things are really critical, but I think the sort of imperative that we control that conversation becomes more and more significant, you know, as, as we, as we move forward. Um, and I think, you know, I think exploring sort of an architecture of boundaries um, that it are not is really not about the kind of assembly of, of pieces into a wall, but in fact, to this kind of like space around a building and the impact of a building on that space around it. I think those are things that are really central to us. Um, and I think keeping that broad perspective is really complicated. Um, but I think, you know, I think what architects are trained to do is to think really synthetically. And I think that's that's even more urgent now. So thank you. You have time for a few questions, Kevin? For sure. <laughs> All right, audience, you're on stage. Uh, any questions from the audience? Anybody online, Raymond? Good evening. My name is Enrique, and you were talking about the 50, 50 Hudson Yards um, with the terrace. What was the process of, you kind of briefly touched out on it, but what's the process of actually making that possible? Like, did you have to, like, apply through some kind of zoning change or something with the city? Like, what was that process like? Um, no, it, I, so it was it was allowable to have a terrace there. Um, it wasn't the the base building wasn't really constructed to support the amount of weight that came with planting and and 
and and you having that many people on it. So one part of the process was really kind of significantly strengthening the framing underneath that terrace. Um, and and then, you know, and I think one idea behind this canopy piece um, was it also had to, it had to, the kind of building, you know, maintenance scaffold also had to be able to land on it in an emergency. So, you know, so that kind of constrained some of the geometry but we really wanted to touch the building only in a limited number of places because we also had to carry that force back through the building. So there's kind of a lot of you know complicated coordination with the main building, but really it was it was a lot of kind of you know routine things pushed to an extreme. Thank you. Any other questions in the audience? Okay, way up at the top. Um, speaking of Hudson Yards, I was wondering if there are any design guidelines you had to follow given it was a part of a larger like luxury development or if there are any challenges with that? Uh, what we proposed had to be approved by the developer and by the kind of architect for the base building, but that ended up not being that big of an issue because I I think we wanted to you know we wanted the intervention in it to be really minimal anyway. Right. Thank you for the lecture and just the incredible work. Uh, the just the comment about the, the endowment building seems a bit different. I mean, you can see the themes that are consistent with the other work, uh, but this suddenly everything is much more clear, clear typologically and orthogonal. Not none of the the formal idiosyncrasies that actually characterize some of the other work. Is that due to the, is, is that coming from the collaboration? Is, or is, is that something that you see also being integrated in your own uh, kind of uh, of moving forward? Or is this an outlier? Um, <clears throat> I don't really know. Like I said, I think a lot of the people, a lot of people who look at our work kind of say that I, I see it's all related, but it, none of it looks the same. Um, I think I think having, I think the collaboration certainly is part of it. Um, and I think if it just looked like it fit perfectly within the kind of body of work we have, then it probably would not have been a very successful collaboration. Um, so, you know, so, if, you know, for sure, you know, I think that building was a consequence of, of the kind of collaboration we undertook. Um, I think there were also, you know, the, the budget issues were, were so extreme um, and the pace and the schedule and the kind of challenge of working at a distance and working remotely. I think that tended to kind of shift things to, to making much simpler decisions or kind of simplifying the kind of range of possibilities we considered. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, you know, at one point we were kind of keeping up with the people fabricating the cladding. You know, they built this really robust Revit model of the entire building, you know, every single screw that was gonna go into the cladding and so, I think in some ways that put a lot of pressure on just kind of the sort of issues of, of kind of a of kind of visual clarity that made it so that we were solving a smaller number of a smaller number of problems as we as we developed it. I want to echo Rudolph's uh, comments. Great lecture. I'm really interested in the Berkeley plan and the transitional housing, and especially how you presented it, suggesting that, you know, there really weren't any other typologies to look at, and you were kind of inventing a typology, if you will. 
um, and suggesting programmatically how someone in that situation might use space. Have you had a chance to sort of visit it, you know, post occupancy and understand if the collaborative spaces, the kitchen, you know, do they work as anticipated sort of programmatically? Has this been a jumping off point for the program or any other projects like it that you're aware of? It's definitely affected other projects we've developed. That one didn't get built, unfortunately. Um, uh, I think I think it would have been a fantastic project. Um, kind of a long story in why that didn't happen, but um, but yeah, it did. It it got kind of sidelined. I think the developer at the time really was insistent on looking at strategies for prefabrication, modular construction which you know was just like the worst idea it was a tiny little project it had power lines everywhere and you could see that it was going to be a problem but they were really you know i think they were i think a lot of the affordable developers are so um concerned with the issue or the kind of challenge of affordability affordable construction um that they thought that it was going to be like a magic bullet they had to explore this as a prefabricated project and it just it really didn't work um so they ended up using a much more conventional design it's a much more conventional building um and one of our colleagues claim you know i think claimed that they were going to bring like some grant money from the county to it and so the whole decision making process just kind of unraveled so All right, I'll go you and then I'll stop there. Yes, thank you for your lecture and the work. It's very, very nice to see it. I was just interested in the um, sort of the structure of your office, how many personnel you have, and then how you sort of organize to do the projects. And also, you know, how, mu how much work do you do at once, you know, do you break yeah, into teams? Yeah. And... Um, <clears throat> I would say that for the most part, projects have three or four people working on them. And in some ways they can get bigger, but they but the then the pace ends up stretching out so that's it's three or four people. Um, except Hudson Yards. Um, that was gigantic. It was, you know, probably three hundred and fifty million dollars worth of construction. So we actually worked um, with a with a, a big firm, KPF, um, who had joined us on the project when it was going to be at a different site altogether. So kind of we already kind of had a team and you know, we like them and they liked us and we trust each other. So we didn't on that project, we didn't do the construction documents. One of the few projects that we haven't done the construction documents for. Um, but that team probably was 12 people. I mean, the model is like, you know, definitely bigger than me. So they were just like people working on it. So I think that probably had 10 or 12 people at the most. Um, but again, for kind of a shorter period of time, because it was, it was a little bit of an outlier. And your office, what's the, the, the number of people that are in your office? Yeah, so we usually range from, you know, 10 to 20 people depending on the workload. Right now, we're probably at about 12. Uh, hi. Um, one of the, I guess, overall like themes that I saw in your project was really an excellent analysis of site and context and kind of how that impacted your design. I guess my question is, what are the first kind of steps that you take in looking at the environment and the site and kind of the route that you take to use the site and context to impact your design? Um, you know, I think we at some level are kind of like empiricists and kind of think, okay, like what's absolutely essential here? And I think by doing that, try to rule out things. You know, we did a high school that's on Silver Lake Boulevard. You know, it was like, okay, this is going to have a lot of mass on that side of the building. And so you know, try to make at least some kind of site observation that, you know, is, you know, has, has some permanence and some kind of gravity to it. And then make, 
you know, use that as a way to make kind of um, propositions following it. Um, so, I, you know, I'd say that's probably, you know, I mean, I, I, but I think you're right. I mean, I think the, you know, I think site design is probably the least intuitive and kind of more analytical than, than a lot of the other decisions we make. Um, I do feel like if you, especially on the affordable projects, affordable housing, if you don't nail the site plan, you'll just, the project will get ruined, you know, because there are too many opportunities along the way for budget cutting to happen and things like that. So you really have to make sure the project has integrity at the level of the site plan in a way that just can't be changed. So. Any other questions? I think we've had a good a good run. Uh, we'll say thanks one more time, Kevin, and thank you for traveling here from LA and for the great presentation. Thank you.